Arizona has made the World Series, while Cincinnati tries to figure out what they need to make it to the postseason. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, award-winning baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're probably part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And I want this to be your show. If you have ideas for us, questions for Monday's mailbag, anything like that, tons of ways to get them to us. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. We have email. We have a Discord. We have a subtext. It's all, it's all in the episode description. It's all in the show notes. But recording this on Wednesday after the world, uh, after the game seven of the NLCS, Arizona def- goes into Philadelphia, pulls off a heist in the bank, goes into Citizens Bank Park, wins game six and seven, and the Arizona Diamondbacks are on to the World Series to take on the Texas Rangers. Tons of, pro- of rookies and prospects in that are on those rosters. We'll get to them in a second. But I want to talk about Brandon fought. So it was the game seven start was not Zach Gallen, was not Merrill Kelly. It was Brandon fought. And Brandon fought had a tough year this year. He made 19 appearances, 18 starts, and he went three and nine with a 572 ERA. He had a 1406 whip in the regular season. And it's a little bit surprising that he got as many opportunities or that they were going to use him like they were in the postseason. But uh, pitching coach Hank Strom has had faith in Brandon Fott, and he was a different pitcher in the postseason. So game one of the NL wildcard against Milwaukee, not a great outing for Brandon Fott. Two and two-thirds innings, seven hits, three runs, one walk, and four strikeouts. Since then, he's thrown 14 innings, with eight hits, two runs, and two walks. And those walks and those runs came in Game 7 on Tuesday night with 18 strikeouts. Brandon Fott has been a completely different pitcher in the postseason than he was in the regular season. And one of the reasons we've seen Brandon Fott be so much better in the postseason, one, I feel like it's just confidence. He he just feels more comfortable that he like that he his stuff is going to work, but we've seen him tweak the pitch arsenal, uh, the pitch mix a bit in the postseason. So in the regular season for Brandon Fott, forty five percent four seam fastball, right? Uh, behind that, then he threw the sweeper about twenty seven percent, and then it was change up, sinker, curveball in that order. Uh, sinker, curveball, sinker was like ten percent, curveball was just over five. And nothing really graded out well except for the breaking pitches. As far as the run value uh, and how they did it preventing hard hits, preventing runs. But the sweeper, very, very good. He throws it about 84 miles an hour. And it's only allowed a 180 batting average against. So in the postseason, features the sweeper. Brandon Fott throws 22 sweepers in his 64 pitches to the Philadelphia Phillies. Gets 14 swings, 10 of those are swings and misses. The CSW rate, called strikes plus whiffs, of the sweeper for Brandon Fott, 50%. Only two of the 22 sweepers he threw were put into play. And then instead of just running fastball, he threw equal parts, four-seam fastball, and sinker. So either you knew this pitch was going to break assuming it's a righty, this pitch was going to break away from you in the sweeper. You knew it was going to be up in the zone, or it was going to run in on you, or he was going to three through ten change-ups. Just enough change-ups for it to drop down below your bat. So he's using all the directions. He's got multiple different velocity bands. The change-ups coming in around 89, 90 miles an hour. Not the usual 10 miles an hour of separation we're looking for with the fastball because the fastballs were around 95. But you've got sweeper 
in the, it averaged 85, a little bit harder in this outing. I think he knew he wasn't going to be going 100 pitches. He knew he was going to go 60 pitches or so. So a little bit harder with the sweeper, but it's still low 80s. You've got high 80s on the changeup, and you've got low to mid 90s on the fastball, because I think the max there was 95. The the average was 93 and a half or so. So you've got multiple directions. You've got multiple velocity bands, and you've got a Pretty good distribution as far as the mix of them. Again, 25% four seamers, 25% sinkers, 34% sweepers, 16% changeups. So Brandon fought exactly as we all expected. He's the one to go into Philadelphia and knock off the Phillies and send the Diamondbacks to the World Series. And this World Series, I mentioned earlier, but this World Series is going to have a ton of of young players in it. So just going off of the championship series rosters, Arizona is going to have Corbin Carroll, Slade Sassoni, Jordan Lawler, Ryan Nelson, Brandon Fott, and Andrew Salfrank. Those six rookies, including uh, Lawler, who still has prospect eligibility, on their roster. The Rangers are going to have Josh Young, who's been up all year, obviously, Cody Bradford, the lefty in the pin, for the postseason, and Evan Carter, who we absolutely love Evan Carter. We've talked about him. We talked about him being a potential X-factor when he first got called up for the postseason. And we saw Corbin Carroll be the star for the Diamondbacks on Tuesday night after a very quiet series. He goes three for four. He steals second base twice, scores both of those times, also gets a sack fly late in the game for an insurance run. And on the year for Corbin Carroll, this is your National League Rookie of the Year. There's not a question on this. 155 games for the All-Star in Corbin Carroll. 285, 362, 506. 25 home runs, 54 stolen bases, leads the National League in triples with 10, just plays... Uh, Left, center, plays right. He can play all of them at a great level. One of the fastest players in baseball. The only knock on Corbin Carroll would be that you don't necessarily love the strength of his arm. Outside of that, can do just about anything you want. Going to be the National League Rookie of the Year. And then in the American League, Josh Young was battling for it with Gunnar Henderson until he got hurt. He only played in 122 games. But you'll remember us saying this much better defensively than we were expecting Josh Young to be at third base, was also an all-star. And this is 122 games, 266, 315, 467, 23 home runs, uh, only steals one bag. He's one for four on stolen bases. Not a big part of his game. 30 walks to 151 strikeouts, but gives them really good defense, gives them clutch hitting at third base, and then you combine him with, with Evan Carter, Uh, And then, as we talked about the other day, Adolis Garcia in the outfield. And you've got plenty of of young, youthful enthusiasm on this team and plenty of reason for prospect folks like us to tune in and be excited for this matchup with all of these rookies. Uh, In just a minute, I I cut this short because I wanted to address the World Series, but we talked to Jeff Carr of Locked on Reds about how close they were to making the postseason and if they're going to have more prospects who could debut in 2024, not the level they had in 23, but how many prospects they could have in 24 they could debut and help them get over that hump and make it to the postseason. I'll bring you that conversation next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Ibotta. If you're getting ready for Thanksgiving and you decide, you know what would be great is if this Thanksgiving dinner was free, then Ibotta is here to help you get cash back and make sure your Thanksgiving table is complete. Starting November 1st for the fourth year in a row, Ibotta is giving you 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving feast. Just add the offers in the app to redeem for everything you need to make your Thanksgiving feast complete. All you have to do is shop at your favorite retailers and upload your receipt because Ibotta normally gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items, produce, personal care, pantry goods, meat, whatever it may be, so that you can beat inflation no matter what you're purchasing. But again, starting November 1st for the fourth year in a row, Ibotta is giving 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving feast. So download the Ibotta app now, use code 
MLB to get 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving dinner starting November 1st. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotic app and use code MLB. That's Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A, in the Google Play or App Store and use code MLB. You know, for a team that was so future focused in 2023, the Cincinnati Reds aren't really looking at a ton of top prospects getting called up. So when we look at the future and when we look at what the Reds may have in 2024, no better place to go than our host of Lockdown MLB Prospects is Lindsey Crosby. Uh, he even got to call a game for the Chattanooga, a couple of games for the Chattanooga Lookouts this season. And, and, and Lindsey, first, I think everyone is is really, really intrigued by one name, and that is Blake Dunn, because he was a guy that we heard a lot about at the end of the season, a, a lot about as a possible candidate uh, for the outfield next year. Mm -hmm. uh, there is definitely a need for like a right-handed platoon option, somebody who can play any of the spots, not necessarily one of the outfield spots. And it feels like Blake Dunn could be that guy. Yeah, and the thing for Blake Dunn, I think the reason you heard so much of him was – this is just the first time he's had a chance to play in his career, right? So he gets drafted and misses promptly just about two full years. Broken nose, couple different fluky injuries, nothing chronic. But goes out last year, 124 games between high A and double A. And just looks absolutely dominant. 312, 425, 522 is the combined slash line. Uh, 23 home runs. 40, 45 extra base hits? Yeah, 45 extra base hits. And the week that I spent doing Montgomery versus Chattanooga, the only player that stood out more to me than Junior Caminero was Blake Dunn. Uh, he led off every single game, played center field every single game, and it felt like every single game he was a constant nuisance for Tampa Bay's pitchers, Montgomery's pitchers, because he would inevitably either walk or get a base hit every single at-bat. He'd be a threat to steal, every single pitch and would just he like the whole offense flowed because he got on base and was so dangerous so uh, it's you've got a bit of a learning curve still he only got 77 games in Chattanooga and that's the extent of its upper minors experience so I don't think he's going to be a out of spring training option right uh, but he is you know he's 24 years old and so developmentally uh, you know maturity wise He's very, he's, he's kind of a baseball veteran. He hasn't done everything, but he's been around the game for a long time. And he spent two full years in essence, rehabbing and not able to play. And so he really, you can tell from talking to him, he really enjoys the game. He really understands and appreciates the opportunity he has. And he's really driven and committed to being successful. And so I absolutely do see him as a guy, like you kind of mentioned, platoon bat, right-handed hitter. I do think the power's good, the speed's good, the arm is very good. Uh, if you didn't have such good defensive center field options, I think he'd profile as a good center fielder, but I could absolutely see him in right field and being a very, I won't say dominant, but a very, very good, possibly a, a regular starter in right field simply because he brings some of everything, brings some speed, brings some power, uh, good batter's eye, good defense, good arm. It's, it's interesting because uh, we, we talked a little bit about him throughout this offseason so far, kind of mentioned him a few different times, and uh, really looking forward to seeing what he could bring to this team. I, I keep seeing different rec or, or, uh, different uh, comparisons to TJ Friedel and, and the fact that you know Blake Dunn maybe even has a little bit more hype than TJ Friedel, but they still weren't the guys that are like really high up on the list. Like When he gets caught up, Steve and I probably aren't doing an emergency episode, although we will be very excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, he's one of those players that he's flown under the radar. I think partially because he just disappeared for two years, right? Mm -hmm. The shoulder, the, the broken nose, all those kind of issues. I think it was cumulative 50 games over two seasons that he got total between rehab, rookie ball, single A, Daytona, all of that. And so, He's not going to get a lot of the acclaim. He's not very high on the prospect list. I want to say both MLB Pipeline and Baseball America have him outside the top 20. But he's absolutely somebody that when he comes up, he has the potential, if everything works right, to, to click and to dramatically help this, uh, this team. I think the difference in him and Friedel is... 
TJ Friedel doesn't really feel like he inherently has a lot of power. All of his home runs look to be like, you know, he, he, he pulls them to right field and he's, he's making do with subpar contact where Blake Dunn, I don't have the, the actual, uh, stat cast numbers for double A. Those are proprietary, but from just my time calling the games and what the Tampa Bay organization would give me while I was in the, the, the press box. He's making consistent, high-quality contact. He's got good swing decisions. And so he feels like maybe a a leveled-up version of TJ Friedel, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so I think if I had to pick one or the other, I'm probably picking Dunn over Friedel, not just because of the beard, but also because of how good he is and what he could be at the major league level. His whole thing is just he hasn't had the opportunity to show the Baseball Americas, the MLB Pipelines, everybody else, how good he is. And I think if he has a year next year like he had this year he would be higher than 22nd on the prospect rankings yeah i think uh, you and i both can really appreciate a good beard um Mm -hmm. listening on audio right now uh lindsay's like the only person in the world that makes me feel insecure about my beard. (laughs) but um when it comes to like a guy like blake dunn like the, the opportunity i think is there a little bit but it's not the same as it was this past season and just to kind of get your take on what the Reds did this year, because I know from a Reds perspective, we came into this season hearing, oh, the future's bright. Oh, there's so many great prospects that are coming up. We heard that a lot over the last 10, 15, 30 years, basically. And we never got this kind of turnout to kind of put it into perspective, like just watching from the outside and seeing how the Reds did that, how does that register to you when it comes to like remembering other teams and their big years of rookie performances? I mean, this is one of the most, I guess, rookie laden, the most most youthful teams I can remember in a while. I think the big thing to me is in the span of one season, the entire infield turned over and they were all like, it was, it was just every couple weeks, there's another prospect we're going to call up and install in the infield. And you do have some veterans there. Jonathan India is the elder statesman at 27. Joey Vada comes back, you know, is there for a while, but for the most part, the entire infield was youngsters and the injuries worked out where for the most part, you didn't have to move them to the outfield other than Spencer steer and left. And I think one of the questions from the outside we had was who gets moved when you bring all the prospects up, right? Does, right. does Matt McClain move back to his college position of center field? You know, who, who gets shifted around to the outfield? Does Ellie De La Cruz get tried out there? Who gets moved out there? And nobody did except for Spencer Steer because he can kind of play everywhere. At the same time, he's, he's there. He's not giving you anything amazing defensively, but that was the big question from the outside was okay you've got all of these guys where are they all going to play and it worked you saw it work out where they all played in the infield now you're looking at how do we upgrade the outfield jake fraley I feel like had a you know pretty good year tj friedel has shown some promise but hasn't done enough and then there's the question of the power i think blake dunn is a is a piece i think reese hines could potentially be a piece he's behind him in a lot of different ways but uh, the question now is just how much can you get for the outfield in the next, like over the course of the next season? I think that's the weakness is upgrading that and then maybe some some work with the staff and just improving those guys for 2024. You mentioned Reese Hines, and, and one of the reasons that I kind of wanted to look at that, look at how the Reds did this past season is because obviously there's not going to be that like crazy class of rookies that the Reds have just yeah. because – can't really do that two years in a row because well if you did it two years in a row that would mean you had some other issues <laughs> but with what the reds have coming up who could make the biggest difference coming up next year i want to talk about that coming up next before we talk about that though got to tell you about one of today's sponsors and that is jace medical you know with all the uncertainty that goes on in the world all the different things that are out of our control it is important to be prepared maybe you're traveling overseas maybe there are events taking place around you that you don't influence whatsoever but they are influencing you don't let your health be out of control jace medical wants you to be in control that's why they have the jace case 
The Jace case is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life-saving medications based on your unique needs. Jace Medical now offers that customization for your Jace case with dozens of add-on medications. Choose the medications that best fit you and your family's unique needs whenever situations arise that maybe you didn't necessarily prepare for, but you will be prepared for with the Jace case. You can also buy gift cards for family or loved ones or friends so that they can go get a Jace case of their own. Go to jacemedical.com and enter the promo code locked on at checkout for a $20 discount on your order. That's promo code L O C K E D O N at J A S E medical.com. Thanks for checking out today's Locked On Reds, Locked On Prospects crossover as we are looking at the possible future of the Reds. We talked about Blake Dunn and he could possibly be a dude for the Reds. There's not a ton of opportunity out there. I, I think the Reds began 2023 almost as a land of opportunity for a prospect that was going to get called up to the major leagues next year. It's going to be about filling in the margins and really from a major league perspective, we want to see the reds go out and make trades. We want to see the reds go out and make some free agent deals, bring in some bona fide dudes, but there are still some dudes that could come up within the organization that could make an impact. Not named Blake Dunn, who is kind of your first dude on the list. So the first guy on the list, it, it's going to be a little underwhelming to some folks because he's he's a reliever, but Zach Maxwell. Uh, okay. So he's in the Arizona Fall League right now, <clears throat> and a guy that, one, physically imposing. Zach Maxwell's 275 pounds. He is a big guy. He also, to go along with that, has a big fastball. One of the better fastballs in the minors absolutely devastating up in the zone and so he's been working in relief in arizona he's looked very very good it, uh, from a performance perspective from an intimidation perspective uh he's he's allowed two earned runs in eight innings uh i think it's 13 strikeouts in those eight innings and right. so someone who is going to come in for bullpen reinforcements we've seen in the postseason this year e even as recently as the last two game sevens, how important it is to have that, to be able to establish that fastball up in the zone and get hitters to swing and miss. And the, the elevated fastball has been so good because guys that have to carry on it up in the zone just miss bats. And his fastball looks like it's rising. That's how much carry it has up in the zone. It's, it's a really, very unique pitch. And so getting him in there is going to be, is going to be very helpful and then Chase Petty is somebody that I'm very intrigued about. I know that that trade was one of the few trades that a lot of fans have been disappointed in. A lot of the returns and the other trades have been fantastic. And people right. have kind of said, you know, we'd rather have Sonny Gray than Chase Petty. And Chase Petty is a very, very talented pitcher. I called one of his starts uh, with Chattanooga versus Montgomery. Very, very good pitcher. He's not quite ready but the talent is there and you have to understand that when he came over to the organization very very young i mean he, he came at age 19 and these players take some time this is a normal development curve but he's been very very good and i think that if everything clicks this off season with a couple key changes he could be in line to make a major league debut by the second half of next year if everything goes according to plan He's a guy too, like, and I think the biggest reason why there's a lot of Reds fans that are just like, man, we wish we'd have that trade back is because we've seen just about everybody else from every other trade. Like yeah. he's the one, him and Edwin Arroyo are really the two guys that it's just like, okay, let's, let's get them up here. Let's get them seen. And it's so funny. The, the, the difference is there because whenever the Reds first made those trades, most of the guys were seen as, Ooh, when are we going to even see these guys? And now mm -hmm. that we've seen all of them, we're starting to rate the other guys that we ain't seen very well. Uh, Chase Petty's a guy that I'm very interested in because he was in Dayton for just a smidge, and I didn't get a chance to see him a whole bunch when you watched him mechanically. Was he a kind of a guy that has repeatable mechanics, or is it more of the, the wacky stuff that you might see they need to tweak a little bit? So it's gotten much more 
calm and reliable since he was first acquired. That was the thing coming out of high school when he was drafted by the Twins was he was a thrower more so than a pitcher. He, the mechanics were kind of a mess, but he could hit 100 miles an hour, right? Uh, he, he, he is pitching a little bit lower velocity now, but his mechanics are a lot more uh, calm, repeatable, in line, biomechanically secure. And, and so because of that, now the secondaries play up a little bit. The slider's better. The change-up's better. It's more reliable as to the location they're going to go, the command, the control, things like that. The biggest change, or the, the, the two things you're trying to get with Chase Petty is one, you're trying to get him to go deeper into outings. And a lot of that comes back to his mindset. The, the thing that I noticed more so than anything else when watching his start in person was he's a very emotional pitcher. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but the, one of the hardest things when you're transitioning into professional baseball is to learn how to harness the emotion, what is useful for me to improve my performance, and what do I need to learn to let brush off my back and move on. And the move on part is where he seemed to kind of struggle with, you know, he'd have a pitch, he thought it was a strike, it wasn't a strike. And rather than get get the ball back, you got the clock running, get ready for the next pitch, he would be dwelling on that bad call, and then the inning would snowball. And that's why his outing would end up stopping early because he'd get pulled because all of a sudden it's a four spot and that fine line between using the emotion to fuel your performance and letting it consume you is one of the toughest things for a young pitcher to pick up but once you can do that once you can learn to to harness that and kind of not dwell on the bad but just focus and grind that's where you can really take off and excel. And I think Chase Petty's this close. The stuff looks really good. The split change is good. The fastball is great. It's just a matter of the mindset and being able to come back if something goes wrong. He's that close to, to being ready. I remember a couple of different conversations with Bronson Arroyo talking about how cerebral pitching is. And it's not it's not all about the stuff. The stuff yeah. is nice, and that's what you see. But it's what goes on in your mind. and. He had some he had some funny examples about that, and I'm kind of getting some flashbacks hearing you describe Chase Petty that way. Um, hope, hopefully, that is something that he kind of works through here soon. You mentioned a few moments ago. You mentioned Reese Hines, and he is a guy that, as he's moved through the minors, I, I've been very intrigued about because mm -hmm. there, there's not been one uh, announcer, whether it be our, our friend Tom Nichols up at Dayton, whether it be our friends in Chattanooga, anybody that has watched him play that is just like, oh. Dude could hit the tundra. Forget about the sign at Great American Ballpark for the tundra. He could hit the tundra that's back yeah. behind everything. But he's had that high strikeout rate. Mm -hmm. Is that something that he could play with or maybe kind of cut down? I mean, that's been a question for like three years now. So obviously the question the answer might be a little bit easier than I'm wondering here. Well, like so last year, uh, it was 111 games. He ended up with 154 strikeouts. It's like a 35% strikeout rate. He's always going to be a higher strikeout rate player. That's who he is. It's a matter of can you can you rein it in a bit? Can you pick and choose your moments? And it felt like a lot of his issues came up um, against righties. He felt like he was much better as far as picking up the spin and not biting on pitches down and away when he faced a lefty. So some of it's just the recognition. And then some of it is the consistency, right? Like he needs to be on the field. He missed time in multiple, like multiple spurts last year with hamstring issues. He, he, I think he only played 10 games in July. He only got like nine games in September and it was both because of hamstring issues. And so when he first comes back, he looks worse and it takes him some time. His best month last month or last year was the month of June when he was when he had gotten comfortable in double A. He was finally understanding here's where that tacky baseball is going to be up in the zone when they throw me a fastball. He had he had been played almost every day for three months. He was in a groove and then he gets hurt again and he misses time. And so the power's amazing. You're right. He's the only, probably the only person who could hit the tundra. Uh, but it's a matter of being a little bit more restrained with your swing decisions against uh, right-handed pitching 
and then just being able to be in the lineup every day to stay in that groove. He's that guy that needs to play every day, that needs to be seen at live pitching every day to perform. If you call him up and he is a is your fourth outfielder, he plays twice a week, he's never going to be successful. And that's just the kind of player he is. And because he's that kind of guy, you can't call him up and ease him into it. He has to be ready to go. I would I would put him in AAA next year if it was me. I know he only got 111 games or so in AA, but I'd put him in AAA because I want him to be facing the best pitching that he's going to be facing in the minors, and I want him to be able to play every single day so that we can call him up and say, hey, I'm ready for you to come in and play every day in right field with that massive arm you have. Uh, it's it, it's absolutely a weapon, but it's just you've, you've got to work on the swing decisions against righties. That's going to be the big thing. Can you not swing on the slider down in the way? And uh, can you be restrained chasing fastballs up in the zone? But it's definitely something that we're going to be watching as spring training, you know, gets closer. I mean, the offseason really technically hasn't even started yet, but yeah. we're, we're already looking forward to pitchers and catchers reporting and the Reds being out in Goodyear, Arizona, working toward next year. Lindsay, appreciate you joining us so much. Thanks for having me.